Speaker's series. Please silence all electronic devices and rise for the presentation of colors and the singing of the national anthem. Early light, what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner Thank you, uh, Dr. Kerry Meyer from the Environment and Energy Resilience Team and the Color Guard for that inspirational uh, performance. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Uh, my name is David Asiello, the Director for Sustainability and Acquisition within the Office of the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Environment and Energy Resilience. On behalf of Washington Headquarters Service and our office, we're very pleased to host this year's Pentagon Earth Day event, Invest in Our Planet, Protect Our Future. It's not a bad day to have it. And welcome all of our military members and DOD personnel, other agency representatives, friends and family, and our distinguished visitors. I don't have a list of all the distinguished visitors, but I know a couple would be here today, so I don't see her yet. But uh, Ms. Sherry Goodman, who is our first Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Environmental Security, is here and really helped. There she really helped uh, put us on the map when it comes to environmental and kind of changing the perspective of environment within the Department of Defense, focusing it more around environmental security and mission and really realizing that this is an opportunity for the department to be successful. Um, I also see that, um, oh, and Ms. Goodman hired me 23 years ago and I wanna thank you for that, ma'am. I think, I think I wanna thank you for that. <laughs> Good to see you, ma'am. Um, also, I see uh, the Honorable Sharon Burke here um, in the and also our first co-chair for the Senior Sustainability Council. It's always great to see you, ma'am. Thank you for both being here. Um, 
And of course, I want to recognize Mr. Richard Kidd, our Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Environment and Energy Resilience. It was, it was Mr. Kidd's vision, tenacity, help, guidance that really put this, got us to put this uh, Earth Day event on. So I want to thank you, Mr. Kidd. And certainly, last but not least, Mr. Reginald Mack. I don't know where he is, but uh, Mr. Mack is, did all behind the scenes, um, really, really a, a, a yeoman's effort to put this on. Without Mr. Mack, this wouldn't have occurred. So um, we're going to move right into our, our speaker series. I'd first like to um, introduce um, and welcoming Washington Headquarters Service Director, Mrs. Regina Myers. Miners, sorry. In her capacity, Mrs. Miners manages a vast portfolio of complex and integrated operational and support services to the Office of the Secretary of Defense, the Joint Staff, the Military Departments, Defense Agencies and DoD field activities, Congress, and the White House. Overseeing seeing nearly 4,000 civilian, military, and contractor personnel and providing a full range of facilities, security, human resources, contracting, financial management that support the national. Thank you. I have to say, I'm going to re-emphasize and underscore what you just said. What a day for our celebration. You can take a deep breath and feel the nice air. Our trees are in full bloom. Clear skies, what else can we ask? And it's very emblematic of what we're all here to do today. But again, as mentioned, I'm Regina Miners. I'm the director of WHS. Um, and I would like to also welcome you as one of the co-sponsors uh, to this great event. Um, and thank you, uh, my co-sponsor from the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, Environment, and Energy Resilience Office for joining us as a partner in this. Um, also, I know we're going to be hearing uh, from some distinguished speakers later, um, the Honorable Brendan Owens, um, Mr. Joe Bryant, and of course, Caroline Baxter. Collectively, these senior leaders are shaping the department's strategic policy course on all matters related to energy, installations, and in the environment, including operational and facilities energy, installations, maintenance, and environmental planning, and sustainability. So we will certainly be looking forward to hearing your remarks. I'd also like to acknowledge all the teams from across the DOD components, as well as our external partners, who have all had a hand in helping us organize this absolutely incredible event. We've been doing Earth Day celebrations here for quite a while, but this one is for the record books. Um, so I'm so happy to be a part of it. And I hope that once this program is, concludes, and if you haven't gotten a chance, that you scoot inside the Pentagon at Apexes 1 and 2 and 9 and 10 to look at some of the exhibits. They're absolutely inspiring, and they actually reflect the behind-the-scenes industriousness and innovation of our technical teams and staffs and subject matter experts from across the department, WHS, elements across many of the DOD components, including the military departments, DLA, OSD, um, who do work like this every day, and they're kind of out of view until days like this when we pull them in view, but they're accomplishing incredible, incredible things. The exhibitors uh, that you will see um, will show how DOD is actually reducing greenhouse gas emissions, improving energy and water efficiency, what we're doing with electric vehicle stations and transitioning our fleet to electric vehicles, improving greenhouse initiatives, bolstering recycling and composting, and of course, expanding stormwater management and natural resource conservation. Our interagency partners, the Environmental Protection Agency, General Services Administration, and U.S. Department of Agriculture are also there to provide insights on the impactful federal energy and climate initiatives that are underway as well. So, why are we here? Um, as you all probably know, Earth Day was founded in 1970 by Wisconsin Senator Gaylord Nelson, 
Senator Nelson sought to create a day when each year people would gather locally to discuss the environmental issues that they faced. And it was his hope that that grassroots local gatherings would affect not only local action, but be contagious and in turn influence national change. So now 53 years later from that first event, Earth Day has grown globally and is celebrated in nearly 200 countries around the globe. As mentioned, this year's Earth Day theme is invest in our planet, protect our future. So we are compelled to be deliberate in our actions and our intents with regard to what we are doing within our respective spheres of influence to improve the sustainability and livability of the planet, but to, to discern and plan for the underlying economic proposition for their achievement. Here on the Pentagon Reservation, WHS is the facilities and infrastructure operational lead agent, is fully committed and is structured for executing this charge. In the discharge of our mission, we treat every day as Earth Day with our energy, environmental, and sustainability programs instantiated in and executed through talented staffs within multiple divisions inside of WHS, including our Pentagon Services, our Engineering and Architecture Group, our Construction Management Team, our fa Federal Facilities and Lease Facilities Teams, and our Standards and Compliance Group. Thank you all for the efforts that you do every day. I am really, really proud you're on the WHS team, it goes without saying. But it is through these collaborative efforts that WHS has recorded some pretty significant achievements. We have reduced agency-wide energy consumption by 14%, including 17% at the Pentagon since 2015, helping to contribute to DOD's overall goal. We are also continuing to implement multiple projects throughout the Pentagon Reservation to further improve energy and water efficiency and resilience. For example, WHS has made significant progress replacing all light fixtures in the Pentagon with new LED lighting. Do you realize how many light fixtures there are in the Pentagon? <laughs> Yikes. As you know, LEDs are more uh, energy efficient, require less maintenance, and save money. And in that regard, this project is estimated to save annually 26,000 plus megawatt hours, equating to $2.1 million annually. WHS has also replaced 2,500 water fixtures in all Pentagon restrooms with high efficiency fixtures, saving 164 million gallons of water and a $1.4 million savings annually. As you can imagine, high efficiency water fixtures are designed to not only reduce water usage, which diverts less water from our rivers, bays, and estuaries, resulting in healthier environments. At the Pentagon Heating and, Re and Refrigeration Plant, WHS is installing high efficiency chillers, which will annually save over $1 million as well. When it comes to new construction, and major renovation projects, and I'm sure anybody who's traversing the Pentagon Reservation is bumped into a cone or a diversion or a walking plank that's been installed to divert you away from a construction zone. But when it comes to our new construction, WHS incorporates energy and water efficiency, stormwater management, and sustainable procurement into the design and procurement, I'm sorry, the design and construction process of our projects. New WHS facilities are typically required to achieve building certification under the U.S. Green Buildings Council Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, commonly known as the LEDD, LEED system. As you know, this rating system provides a framework to create healthier, efficient, and cost savings green buildings. Since 2000, WHS has constructed 12 projects, including the Mark Center down the road and four wedges of this building that have earned LEED certification from the Building Council. By the end of 2025, we are anticipating that we will complete four additional projects that will earn 
the LEED certification as well. We have also achieved a gold rating under the LED, LED operations and management rating system at the Mark Center, demonstrating that we are not only sustainable in new facility design and construction, but also operations and maintenance. So it goes without saying that we are very, very proud of these achievements and are doubling down on our attentions to record additional achievements and other ongoing and scheduled long-term projects. WHS also maintains a very comprehensive solid waste management program at the Pentagon and the Mark Center to divert as many materials as possible from landfills through our recycling and composting initiatives. Our efforts are aligned to support DOD's goal to divert at least 50% of waste by 2025 and 75% of waste by 2030. In fiscal year 22, 2022, the Pentagon diverted 52% of its waste through recycling and composting, which included a building-wide program to collect common recyclables, such as paper and cardboard, cans and bottles, collection of food waste from different the food establishments as well as our executive dining facilities and the collection of pallets, toner, scrap metal, and electronic waste from the remote delivery facility for recycling. We will continue to press proactively with future steps, including the composting of hand towels from our restrooms, improved recycling in the food court sitting areas, and the expansion of food composting at the Mark Center. All of these, we are confident, will help us meet the ambitious 2030 goal. As a measure of our comprehensive commitment, I would be remiss if I did not emphasize that anything, anything that cannot be recycled or composted is disposed of at a waste to energy facility rather than a landfill to help generate electricity within the community. Another sacred pillar that we focus on is the protection of the natural environment. To this end, WHS works to reduce its impact on the natural environment, including the beloved Chesapeake Bay, which is the largest of more than 100 estuaries in the United States. Thus, we take very, very seriously the impact that our rituals and practices here at the Pentagon Reservation have on the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem. To that end, WHS has invested heavily in stormwater management facilities, including green roofs, bioretention areas, and tree box filters that filter pollutants in stormwater before it leaves the site, enters the Potomac River, and flows into the Chesapeake Bay. The best part about the stormwater management facilities is that they are effective in removing the Chesapeake Bay's primary pollutants, which include nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediments. WHS has also completed a riparian buffer restoration project around nine and a half acres of the Boundary Channel and Pentagon Lagoon shoreline within the Pentagon site boundaries, removing invasive and non-native species we in turn have planted over 6,000 native trees and shrubs. The riparian restoration effort, among other things, help us, importantly, achieve compliance with the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act, but also assist in maintaining shoreline integrity by stabilizing the bank and preventing erosion and improving overall conditions in the boundary channel by reducing stormwater pollutant runoff, capturing nutrients and chemicals before they enter the water, and increasing shade along the shoreline to moderate increasing temperatures. Lastly, the WHS fleet, fleet management program established a zero emission vehicle planning and implementation team in April of last year, composed of stakeholders from across a broad spectrum of the DOD components. The goal here is to electrify a fleet of more than 390 government vehicles in the Pentagon, the Mark Center, Raven Rock Mountain Complex and the Suffolk Building locations and provide needed infrastructure at these locations for electrical vehicle charging. WHS has implemented a pilot program using three solar powered charging stations 
with six level two charging ports at the Pentagon to support up to 24 government vehicles. Another 20 charging ports are scheduled to be completed by the end of this fiscal year to support an additional 80 government vehicles. The Mark Center in turn currently has eight charging ports to support up to 32 government vehicles there. Beyond current efforts for the government vehicle fleet, an ongoing study is also developing plans to look at charging infrastructure to support private vehicles at the Pentagon. The study is ongoing and it is going to protract for a while as we understand all the implications for that. In short, all of these initiatives have been efforted and achieved through WHS's enterprising stewardship in generating safer, energy efficient, and resilient operations of its infrastructure here on the Pentagon Reservation in the greater national capital region and beyond. Leading with tangible results and observable effects, WHS has embraced this climate imperative, not only as a part of its mission, but as a privilege to play such a critical role in, oper in maintaining operational resilience and thereby in turn ensuring mission continuity here at the D DOD headquarters. To this end, Albert Einstein once said, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. I am proud to say that in collaboration with our partners and aligned with national commitments and the global imperative for a secure climate, WHS is and will continue to do its, our, its part in protecting the future of our planet. Thank you for being here today. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Miners, to you and your team for all your leadership and helping get this, put this event together, but not just today, like you said, throughout the year, all your leadership in, in environmental issues. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to welcome our keynote speaker for this uh, speaker series, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy Installations and Environment, the Honorable Brendan Owens. Honorable Owens is the Principal Advisor to the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment for all matters related to energy, installations, and the environment, including operational and facility energy, installation maintenance, and environmental planning. He also provides budgetary, policy, and management oversight of DOD's real property portfolio, which encompasses millions of acres and over 500,000 buildings and structures at more than 500 installations. Honorable Owens. Thanks, Dave. The Regina and I were just talking about how big this portfolio is, and uh, I think I, we have Sherry and, and uh, Sharon to, to thank for some of that, certainly. When Mr. Kidd and I were walking around the, the tables, which I, if you haven't done that yet, please take the time after, after we wrap here to, to go do that or sometime during the rest of the day. There is a tremendous amount of, of activity that's happening, and I really think it'd be great for as many people to get there as possible. But we were walking around, and I, I walked by the WHS table, and I asked them what the coolest thing they had going on was, and they mentioned this chiller plant replacement, which is, you know, for, for the Pentagon building, right? Uh, I'm a building, proud, proud buildings geek, and I always will be, I hope. Uh, but they are replacing, it's either three 4,000 ton chillers or four 3,000 ton chillers. 12,000 tons of chillers is a lot, y'all. And that is just like one line in the, in the, in the speech that, that Regina just gave. So there is a tremendous amount of activity that's happening. And I'm, I'm excited to be here to celebrate that activity uh, with, with y'all today. So this is my first Earth Day in this job. I, I started in this position in about late January. Um, so almost all of the stuff, every single thing that we're going to be talking about today predates my involvement. Um, and it is a substantial amount of work that has gone on. So I'm, I'm very happy to be able to celebrate all this with you. So thanks to WHS, thanks to Mr. Kidd's team, Energy and Environmental Resilience, uh, for their hard work in putting this effort together. I want to thank my Reginald Mac. My, thank you very much. Uh, it has, this is, you know, there's so much happening today. Uh, the, of substance, and I, I think it's important for us to pause every now and then and make sure that we recognize all the work that went into that. So our Department of Defense's primary mission 
uh, is to maintain a robust military force that's capable of deterring conflict and ensuring our nation's security. And to effectively carry out this mission, our military departments must have access to essential resources, resources like energy, land, air, and water. Uh, these are required for the development and training of our forces, both now and, and well into the future. So we are committed as a department to protecting our planet and ensuring health and safety for our people. In the spirit of Earth Day, uh, we're here to acknowledge the tremendous amount of work that's being done across the department and to share a little bit about what our vision is for the future. So today, over 50 environmental exhibits are showcasing work that advances the warfighting mission while safeguarding our environment. I'd like to reflect on a few of those recent successes that have enhanced our mission capabilities uh, and are accomplishing the, the goals that the department has set out in response to the Biden administration's agenda. Uh, so we've made remarkable progress in various areas such as operational energy, climate resilience, environmental remediation, and just by way of a couple of examples, in, 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 in terms of operational energy, DOD is the leader on power beaming technology. Uh, because of the investments that we've made, NASA and the Department of Energy are now racing to match and improve on our work to develop this revolutionary means of distributing energy. So power beaming technology could significantly reduce greenhouse gas, gas emissions and lead to space-based solar powered global energy distribution networks for humanitarian response and national defense. Last month, we took an important step towards this future by launching the first groundbreaking demonstration of opt optical power beaming in space. Along those lines, the Electric Tactical Humanitarian Operations Resource Project has resulted in an all-electric autonomous vehicle designed to carry exportable energy to the point of need. The ability to autonomously maneuver through battlefields and disaster events makes it a powerful resource in ensuring the safety of our warfighters while reducing our environmental footprint. The department has also made significant strides preparing for the inevitable impacts of climate change. The DOD climate assessment tool improves on, there's a table on DCAT uh, in, the, in, in APEX 910 make sure you get there. there's really interesting things that are happening, um, improves our ability to make climate informed decision by estimating climate vulnerabilities for all major domestic and international installations. In addition to that, we are poised in the next months to deliver DCAT capabilities to six partner nations. Uh, and in sharing this tool with our partners, it not only enhances our own resilience because we rely on their partnership and, and, and their uh, their uh, facilities in places that were deployed, but it also improves U.S. security. So our allies and uh, are, are partnered for a force multiplier and are one of the greatest strategic assets we have in protecting our nations. The department has also developed water resilience methodologies that greatly advances our ability to assess water management and security at our installations. The methodology provides us with consistent, comparable data and helps us evaluate water risks for, that DOD faces in support and, and make, helps us support decision making uh, to ensure that our installations are resilient. As we shape the more resilient and just future, it is also imperative that we restore lands that have experienced environmental impacts attributable to past military activities. Through the Native, lands, Native American Lands Environmental Mitigation Program, we've remediated over 100 impacted sites and executed 369 cooperative agreements valued at over $179 million with Native American tribes. The goal of this program is to pr prioritize health and human safety by restoring and protecting natural and cultural resources and return tribal lands uh, to optimal use. Shifting the focus to today and the, and the present, what we're doing today and what we're doing in the future, key advancements in energy resilience, environmental stewardship, pollution prevention research and cleanup, and climate resilience will help us confront the greatest challenges, some of the greatest challenges the department is facing. Military facilities must adapt to an increasingly challenging threat environment. Improving energy resilience and reliability is key to that adaptation. Last month, my boss, Under Secretary LaPlante, signed a memo directing DOD components to incorporate into building design, construction, repair, and operations requirements that maximize the use of all electric technologies. This will not only advance the department's goals as laid out in the 2022 NDS, 
and the administrative goals as laid out in Executive Order 14057, but it also leverages the department's growing investment in microgrid technology and electric vehicles to support mission insurance. We're also uh, going to continue to improve energy efficiency of operational platforms to maximize our ability to operate in contested logistics environments. We're pursuing game-changing technologies such as adaptive cycle aircraft engines and blended wing body airframe designs. These technologies can reduce energy use uh, for our operational forces by 20 to 30 percent compared to current systems. Our effort to hybridize ground vehicles and develop microgrids will also decrease our dependence on fuel convoys and increase operational capability. Hybrid technologies leverage auxiliary battery, uh, battery power to reduce fuel usage when tactical vehicles are idle, and this enables capabilities like silent watch and reduced heat signatures, while also greatly decreasing fossil fuel emissions by connecting energy, by connecting energy components, including energy storage, together with our tactical vehicles and, op and the, the electrical side of our tactical vehicles and, op and optimizing the distribution of power, micro microgrids are capable of providing stability of operations both home and in the field, even when our infrastructure is under attack. To get the most out of these technologies, our service members need to be able to train like they fight. DOD manages nearly 27 million acres of unique ecosystems and habitats. This natural infrastructure is critical for providing realistic environments to test new technologies, train our service members, maintain the highest levels of military readiness, and mitigate climate change impacts. The de department is steward of over 500 threatened and endangered species, 55 of which only exist on DOD lands. By working to sustain and restore threatened, endangered species at these and at-risk species, we improve species population, which gives us which enables us to remove species from endangered and threatened lists and prevent future species listings. This enables DOD to carry out mis its mission essential activities. Together, DOD and the Fish U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service recently delisted five species and are working to de- and downlist several more species throughout 2023. These actions reflect the department's continued commitment to species protection while removing restrictions on DOT's DOD's military mission at 16 installations and ranges, which is a huge win for military readiness. Achievements like these are not possible without innovative R&D programs they are constantly, that are constantly advancing the state of science and accelerating the rate of technology adoption. DOD runs, for example, the largest PFAS cleanup R&D effort in the U.S. We're working hand-in-hand -hand with the EPA to develop analytical methods for measuring PFAS in the environment and funding hundreds of PFAS remediation-related research and development projects. While much, of the work, while much work remains on this front, we have uh, developed over 50 successful PFAS treatment technologies, and we've demonstrated PFAS-free firefighting formulations that meet military specification standards, keeping us on track to meet our 2020 NDAA obligations that prohibit the use of PFAS firefighting foam for shore-based systems. We're also ensuring technologies bridge the valley of death and research and research end users as soon as and reach end users as soon as possible. The department established the very first mem memorandum of understanding with the General Services Administration to bring sustainable product innovation to the federal market. GSA will access product performance and pricing information hosted on our DOD Sustainable Product Center to make successfully demonstrated technologies and products quickly available to the federal government. The partnership will help us leverage purchasing power to achieve net zero procurement by 2050. Amid all these challenges, climate change is the constant through line impacting everything. Our operations, military training, equipment, and installations infrastructure must evolve and adapt to the changing conditions we are facing today and will face in the future. The department is actively working to mitigate the impacts of climate change. For example, we are working to ensure that efficiency and low, emb low embodied carbon uh, materials are considered in, in the design and specification for new building construction and renovation projects. And I mentioned earlier how we're moving to all electric systems in those buildings as well. The department's investment demonstrate our unwavering commitment to building a safe and sustainable future for generations. 
As we continue to reduce our environmental impact, we will simultaneously enhance mission capabilities and the effectiveness of our warfighters. So I've listed about a dozen or so innovation, in, initiatives that are currently ongoing within DOD. And in that spirit, I'd like to talk about a few more uh, and formally announce the winners of the 2023 Secretary of Defense Environmental Awards, whose shared commitment to protecting human health and the environment has helped us ensure the highest quality of life for service members, their families, and neighboring communities, both in the United States and overseas. Established in 1962, the awards program recognizes installations, teams, and individuals across military services and defense agencies for their exceptional environmental achievements and innovative cost-effective environmental stewardship practices. The 2023 awards acknowledge exemplary accomplishments from October 1, 2020 through September 30, 2020. at Apex 910 uh, in, on, on floor two. Uh, and each of the, and in most cases, they all the award winners far exceed the criteria and objectives for the awards program. I am pleased to announce the winners of the 2023 Secretary of Defense Environmental Awards. The winner of the Natural Resources Conservation Large Installation Award is Camp Ripley, Minnesota, Army National Guard. The winner of the Environmental Quality Industrial Installation Award is Marine Corps Support Facility, Blunt Island, Florida. The winner of the Environmental Quality Overseas Installation Award is Osan Air Base, Republic of Korea. The winner of the Sustainability Non-Industrial Award is Kadena Air Base, Japan. The winner of the Sustainability Individual Team Award is the 366th Environmental Management Team, Mountain Home Air Force Base, Idaho. The winner of the Environmental Restoration Installation Award is Naval Point Base, Loma, California. The winner of the Cultural Resources Management Small Installation Award is the Iowa Army National Guard. And the winner of the Cultural Resources Management Individual Team Award is the Cultural Resources Office Team, Eglin Air Force Base, Florida. Last but not least, the winner of the Environmental Excellence and Weapon Systems Acquisition Award is the Acquisitions and, Heavy Lo and, and Logistics Heavy Metals Working Group, Washington, D.C. My sincerest congratulations and thanks to all the 2023 SecDef Environmental Award winners on your achievements. Thank you for your dedication and outstanding support to the military mission and the environment. Your contributions reflect the department's focus on innovative approaches to meet the climate crisis and enable us to continually improve mission readiness to ensure our nation's security. More information on this year's winners is available in the press release on defense.gov. I encourage you again, one last time, to, to visit this, the Environmental Awards Program event table uh, on the second floor in Apex 910. There is also a permanent program on display in third floor, on the third floor, Apex 7 and 8. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's difficult to capture the breadth and depth, I think we started off this way, um, of the impactful work that you are all doing uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, after hearing from all the other speakers and visits and visiting the exhibits today, I hope you come away with an even greater picture of our environmental accomplishments and investments and, your, and, un, and, and a better understanding of your critical role in helping us move forward from here. We have a lot more work to do. Uh, but your commitment and creativity and, are, are inspiring, and I look forward to celebrating our achievements often with you. Thanks very much. Um, Honorable Owens, sir, thank you very much for those inspirational remarks and actually for the very short time you've been the leader in the um, in energy installations and environmental organization. We've seen ma amazing growth and thank you, sir, for that leadership. So our first featured speaker, so we have opening remarks speaker, then we had a keynote speaker, now we're going to have one of two featured speakers, is uh, Mr. Joe Bryan. So please, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome the Department of Defense Chief Sustainability Officer and Senior Advisor for Climate, Mr. Joe Bryan. In his capacity, Mr. Bryan reports 
directly to the Secretary and the Deputy Secretary of Defense representing the Department on Sustainability and Climate-Related Matters across interagency forums, implementing sustainability and climate-related actions within DOD, and reporting to the White House on DOD's efforts to achieve federal goals. Mr. Bryan is a true sustainability and climate leader, demonstrating how these issues are critical to the resilience of the Department's mission and our national security. Mr. Bryan. Thanks, Dave. We've got to be a little careful with the wind here with our papers. Uh, my speech could be uh, half as long, which actually might have an upside for those of you in the audience. So we'll see how it goes. Well, good afternoon. Thanks, Dave, again for the introduction. What a great day. Thanks to everybody for coming out. Uh, my name is Joe Bryan, as Dave said, and I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer for the Department of Defense and the Senior Climate Advisor to the Secretary and the Deputy. So uh, today's kind of like Christmas for me. So uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, now. I'm going to pose a question that I, I get on occasion, um, sometimes actually out loud, sometimes not, and that is, uh, why does your job actually exist? And why do sustainability, environmental protection, and climate change, why do those things actually matter to the Department of Defense? So showed up here today. My guess is that many of you know the answer to that, but I'm going to take a shot anyway as my papers fly away. You know, one observer recently said, that to understand the impact of climate change on our world, you don't have to have a PhD, she said. You don't have to be a climate scientist. You just need to be a person who looks out the window. Now, I understand this is a little tricky in here since the Pentagon doesn't have that many windows, but I assume most of you have windows at home, so we'll rely on that. And what are, the, what are we seeing, those of us who actually have windows, what are we seeing when we look outside? Well, globally, the last eight years have been the hottest eight years on record. Water levels at Lake Mead out west, the largest reservoir in the country, remain at some of the lowest levels since the 1930s and are coming dangerously close to threatening the Hoover Dam's ability to supply power. The Bureau of Reclamation predicts that Lake Mead could reach an all-time low again later this year. In California, the Department of Forestry and Fire Protection publishes a list of the largest wildfires in the state since 1932. Eight of the top 10, eight of the top 10 have occurred since 2017, and six of those, six of those have happened in just the last two years. That's 90 years of records, 90 years of records. And don't forget, we have a pretty big footprint out in California, so that matters. And it's not just here in the United States, it's called global climate change for a reason, right? And across the globe, it's impacting countries and regions from China to the Middle East to Africa and Europe. But again, why does any of this matter to us? Why does it matter to the Department of Defense? Well, the truth is you can't run an installation if you don't have any water. And Lake Mead supplies water to Nellis and Creech. You can't prepare for global missions if you're spending all your time responding to crises like floods and wildfires. We know that the National Guard, in fact, spends countless, countless hours on those crises. You can't train if your base is underwater or conditions are too extreme. We know that hurricanes have cost us in readiness and resources over the past few years. Think Tyndall, Lejeune, Offutt, Pensacola, the list goes on, right? And it's not just our military. Remember last summer, the Royal Air Force had to shift airfields after the runway melted, the runway melted at Bryce Norton during a heat wave. Meanwhile, these same conditions, drought, extreme heat, typhoons, hurricanes, create demand for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. They also help drive instability, often in regions and countries already buckling under the strain of poverty, weak governance, and a host of other challenges. And instability, when it rises to conflict, creates demands on our force. And the risk of climate change and environmental degradation to strategies, plans, capabilities, missions, and equipment is growing. And we have to consider those impacts at every level of our enterprise. How will rising seas affect basing posture? How will increasing temperatures impact, com impact combat system, payload capacity, range, and loiter time? Now look, that may all sound like a bad news story, and I'll admit, you know, it's not great. But we're actually not here today to complain. And we're certainly not here to admire the problem. We're here to do something about it. And that's what today is all about, doing something about it. That's in DOD's DNA, taking on the mission, fixing the problem. So look around. Brendan mentioned a whole bunch of examples. Look around and see what's happening around you. There's an exhibit inside from the 
Readiness and Environmental Protection Integration Program, REPI. REPI has helped conserve more than a million acres to sustain military missions at 120 installations in 35 states. That's amazing work. The Army Engineer Research and Development Center has a display where they're demonstrating solutions to reduce the carbon footprint of new construction, including cement production, one of the, one of the most carbon intensive processes we have. And there are hundreds and hundreds of other examples across the department, driving change, solving problems. And from Secretary Austin and Sep Deputy Secretary Hicks on down, we are moving out. Just look at a budget request. Stuck here. Now, millions of dollars, billions of dollars to adapt military facilities to increasingly challenged conditions to deploy sustainable technologies that strengthen resilience to extreme weather and other disruptions that threaten our missions. Investments to improve the energy efficiency of operational platforms to enhance capability and reduce logistics requirements for the deployed force. Research and development to accelerate new platforms like hybrid tactical vehicles that Brendan mentioned, to deliver capabilities like extended range, persistence, silent watch, and the ability to support advanced weapons. We're already doing some of this work, right? I think last year the Army turned on the first hybrid electric Bradley fighting vehicle. Now we're also investing in new platforms, like blended wing body aircraft, that has the potential to increase range, payload, and loiter time while reducing fuel burn by up to 60%. That's a game changer, market transformer. And we're incorporating climate risks into war games and exercises to ensure we understand the impacts on our mission and are prepared to respond. Now this all comes at a pivotal, pivotal moment for the climate and for the global economy, but also for the defense industry and for the Department of Defense. We are in the midst of a massive, massive shift in global energy markets. Last year, more than $1.1 trillion was invested in the energy transition, renewable energy, electric vehicles, and clean energy technologies. That figure, 1.1 trillion, matched investment in fossil fuels for the first time in history. And the International Energy Agency predicts that renewables will account for 95% of all power capacity additions over the next five years. So we're in a moment of change. In the auto sector, the market's going electric fast. Even ExxonMobil CEO, has predicted that every new passenger car sold in the world will be electric by 2040. ExxonMobil. Now this energy transition will define the future, impacting global economies, international relations, and for sure, military capability. And for a long time, we've seen others, namely China, seize the initiative and dominate clean energy markets from solar to storage. But that is changing. The Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law are a clear statement that the U.S. is not just in the game, but that we intend to lead on clean energy. That's great news for the United States, and it's great news for national security. Consider operational energy. The department consumed something like 3 billion gallons of fuel last year to power our planes, ships, and tactical vehicles. That's two-thirds of our total energy use in the department. And it is a logistics challenge to support that demand, even in peacetime. And the joint warfighting concept makes clear that we can't expect a free pass to deliver what we need, where we need it, when we need it to be there. And that includes fuel. So reducing the energy demand of our operational forces is mission essential. But technology advances are opening opportunities for us to mitigate logistics risk. For example, cost reductions in lithium ion batteries driven by the electric vehicle market itself, are opening opportunities for tactical applications. I talked about tactical ground vehicles, but there's opportunities in air flight as well. And the department is prioritizing operational energy demand reduction across the force. Last April, Deputy Secretary Hicks signed a directive making operational energy demand reduction and supportability a priority in the acquisition of all, all new systems, as well as upgrades to existing systems. And the opportunity extends well beyond combat platforms. Global operational missions, we know, 
are often supported and sustained from our fixed installations. On the energy front, technologies like microgrids, distributed generation like solar and energy storage can improve the resilience of critical operations on military bases threatened by both extreme weather, cyber, and even kinetic attacks. And we have great examples of that from sub-base New London to Paris Island to Miramar to Fort Bragg. Again, that's good for the environment, great for the climate, and we should celebrate that. And we can do so, we can do so without losing sight of our primary job. Because our investments, while they're good for the climate and good for the environment, they're absolutely critical to future mission success. And that's the answer to the question I posed a few minutes ago. Why do we think about, why do we invest, why do we care about sustainability, environmental protection, climate change? We do that because it makes it better, us better at our jobs. They matter to the mission. So today we can celebrate what we've accomplished, right? We should be proud of that. Go around the table, see your colleagues, congratulate them for all the good work. But let's be clear, the race isn't over. You know, my dad used to say, don't, hold, don't hurt your shoulder patting yourself on the back because we're not done yet. So thanks for what you do every day, and we'll see you back at work. Thanks. Yep. Sir, as always, thank you for your insightful and forward-thinking remarks and your proactive leadership um, in all things uh, climate and sustainability. So our second um, other featured speaker, I'd like to welcome the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Force uh, Education and Training, Ms. Caroline Baxter. In this capacity, Ms. Baxter serves as the principal senior authority on the development of DOD policy on all issues related to military education and training across the joint force. Her responsibilities include military and joint training policy, professional military education, and joint uh, and training capability modernization, financial readiness, career investment programs to include voluntary education, credentialing, and apprentice, apprenticeship policy. Ms. Baxter. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. It's great to see you. Uh, I'll try to back clean up here as quickly as I can and let us all get back to work. But thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real honor to be uh, um, on this stage with so many amazing speakers. And it's great to see so many colleagues in the audience, Richard, Nancy, Rachel, others, also members of my staff who view this as not just an opportunity but an obligation to uh, listen to me speak. So I'll try to get through my remarks uh, with some alacrity. Uh, Joe and the previous speakers set the stage actually really perfectly for what I wanted to focus on, so let me set the stage for where I'm going to be going. The United States of America is an expeditionary power with a global footprint. We keep people and equipment forward deployed at myriad sites around the world while relying on our ability to project power from CONUS. Any threat that has the global reach to degrade our strategic, operational, and tactical resilience erodes the foundation of the American way of war. What undergirds our resilience isn't our equipment or our installations, but our people. And so, as these global threats emerge and our operating environment changes, so too must we change the way we educate, train, and develop our military and civilian workforce to maintain our warfighting advantage. Today, I'm gonna to try to get beyond the so what of climate change uh, by dispensing with that term entirely, instead focusing on the now what part of that challenge, to link the reality of what the data tells us with the implications for the fights to come and what uniformed and civilian members of the workforce need to know and do. If you're spending time listening to me talk as opposed to pruning your inboxes, you probably already get why this matters. But let me share how my office, Force Education and Training, and the Climate Literacy Subworking Group that I have the privilege to lead talks about it. In short, in the battle for resilience, time is never on our side for long. Let's talk about one fact we're all aware of, sea level rise. Data tells us to prepare for a rise of an additional one to three feet by 2050. Sounds small, sounds far away. Such a rise would threaten 128 coastal DOD installations in the US alone, some of which are critical for power projection, think Naval Station Norfolk, training, Paris Island and Camp Lejeune, and education like the Naval Academy. And by threaten, I mean may flood 100 times every year within the next 27 years. 
Our power projection, training, and education requirements are non-negotiable. We have a new joint warfighting concept. We have operational planning scenarios, mission essential tasks. We have a pacing challenge, driving our educational outcomes. Behind all of these things are assumptions, assumptions about our ability to continue training, educating, projecting power without undue interference beyond the norm. But what if we're wrong? What if decisions do we need to make today about installation management, military construction, among others, to mitigate that risk? If not properly managed, the tactical and operational consequences in the near to midterm will translate into strategic risk over the long term. We have a narrow and quickly closing window to ensure that our workforce can make the right decisions, decisions that will shape our national security and defense for decades to come. A ship is a 50-year investment. A power plant is a 100-year investment. What do we need to know about their operating environment and berthing and installation locations to make sure we can get the most out of all these assets throughout their life cycle? And what do those who manage those assets need to know today to be ready? The evolving security landscape requires us to anticipate those second and third order effects and to determine how they might challenge our readiness over the long term. So let me further explore sea level rise, looking at the tactical, operational, geostrategic impacts as they relate to a future fight and highlight the related decisions that people will need to be able to make. What do rising sea levels mean for our operational risk? Drilling down to just Camp Lejeune, for example, it means increasing swaths of training grounds rendered unusable owing to regular flooding and higher tides, which then degrades training capacity, pushes additional demand onto other installations that might not be able to absorb it. It also means risk to the integrity of military ocean terminal Sunny Point, or Matsu, the nation's largest ammunition and weapons transport hub. Any uncertainty about our ability to rely on training and munition shipments is unpalatable to us and a freebie for our adversaries. So while we still have the time, we need to identify and bound the decisions required to shore up these installations and develop backup plans if that's not possible. This will have implications for what we acquire, like construction equipment, land, how we manage relationships with communities outside those installations, how we develop and prioritize our budgets to ensure things like MILCON exist above the cut line. How does this operational risk tie to a strategic risk? There is a kaleidoscope of if-then possibility, so we'll just take one path. If rising sea levels degrade or force us to move training and power projection installations and we don't respond quickly enough to mitigate the risk, then we might not get to the fight fast enough with adequate training or the promise of resupply on the way. The pressure put on other available installations, places that might not have the infrastructure to support more throughput demand, would slow us down. How does the strategic risk place pressure on our allies and partners? If we can't get to the fight fast enough, then our allies and partners need to be even more willing to host our people and equipment to obviate transit risk and fight perhaps earlier than anticipated. This affects our engagement strategies, tests our basing agreements, adds to our requirements for what we might need to do to shore up those OCONUS installations as well. And at the end of the day, it's all going to cost money. But there's a wild card. Higher sea levels also exacerbate extreme weather, including hurricanes. They cause more destructive storm surges, means more communities in the U.S. will be devastated by those storms. And we're all well aware of the frequency, as Joe mentioned, with which the U.S. military is called up to help civilian communities recover after disasters, which means spending more time on that mission versus training for the fight. But also don't discount the cognitive impact to those families and loved ones who are at risk. So what decisions do we need to make today to be ready for that tomorrow? For the installations community, for example, those places that flood up to 100 times a year, that will start 27 years from now, not very far off in a profession where decisions take a long time to make and execute. For example, this summer, Naval Station Norfolk plans to conclude a $43 million flood reduction project that dates back to 2013. More than 40% of those installations are at greatest risk of flood owned by the Navy, which means someone in the Navy today has to be thinking about the maintenance, resilience, placement, and staffing of installations over the next 30 years. How will existing footprints hold up to changing force projection requirements in the changing environment? How will our international relationships enable a potential future where we need to establish or relocate a critical facility or asset? Answering these questions requires us to keep our resources current with a shifting security landscape and make them accessible to the workforce. 
Last fall, my office issued a voluntary anonymous questionnaire to about 120,000 members of the military and civilian personnel across the DOD to find out what people know today about the changing environment, how it's affecting their mission and role. More than 12,000 of you responded to this pulse check or participated in one of our 34 focus groups to delve deeper into these issues. And you told us that while you're seeing some impacts on your work now, you really anticipate seeing many more of them coming in the next couple of years. And you also told us you haven't received much education, training, or information about the risks and vulnerabilities associated with operating in this environment, and you want to learn more. So we're going to provide it. My office is working across the department and with your leadership to bring you the guidance and resources that you need when you need them, and not in a way that's going to add another box checking exercise to the task you already have to do. Resilience is a product of time and thought. It is not built quickly. Because the evolving security landscape presents a threat to the entire department, we need to ensure commonality of effort so that our approaches are mutually reinforcing. Empowering our people to understand and address these issues is going to go a long way toward the ultimate goal of this event, protecting our future. Thank you for sticking around, and thank you very much for the invitation. Yes, thank, thank you very much, Ms. Baxter. That was very um, enlightening and very focused on where we need to be in, as part of the department. And I appreciate all you're doing to help educate uh, not just our workforce around environmental, but about how it's a capability-based issue that we need to understand how we can do our jobs better. So as I was thinking about this, just the last few seconds, if you look at all the, the there are VIP speakers today, you know, um, Mrs. Miners, um, Honorable Owens, who had to leave, unfortunately, for a, a meeting. Mr. Bryan and, and, and Ms. Baxter, you kind of heard a theme here. And our theme today was what? Um, protect, um, invest in our pl uh, planet, protect our future. And that's the future of not just the environment and our family and friends, but the future of our job, the future of what we do as a, as a nation, what we do as a Department of Defense. We've got to be able to do our jobs, which is defend the country, protect our people. If we can't do that effectively by looking at the environmental issues out there and dealing with them, they're no longer things we can sweep under a rug. And this group doesn't. These leaders don't. And I can see that um, by looking at the folks up here, looking at the, the displays up at the apexes, you know, we're well on our way to doing really good things for the future. So please remember that as we, as we go through this um, day to day. It's just not, not us, it's not you, it's all of us together that have to make this work. So I want to thank everybody for showing up today. This concludes our event. I would please um, strongly recommend that you go visit the exhibits on the second floor apex one and two and ten, nine and ten. And I want to thank everybody for putting this wonderful event together, and we'll look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you.